Talk Time Podcast. Today is Friday, January 6th, and this is episode 14 of our podcast. 14 episodes, guys. That's pretty amazing, right? I, I You know, I past 10, I was like, wow, we're going to do this. Well, today, 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 we celebrate a couple of uh, new dates, really cool dates. National Bean Day. I don't know if some of you like beans, but I love my frijoles, so I'm definitely celebrating today. Apple Tree Day. Mm-mm. And it's also Dia de los Reyes or Day of the Three Kings Day. So if you were, uh, celebrate that as well. I know yesterday I, I bought my rosca and I'm ready to chop it up today and uh, and get the, the niño and have to make tamales in February. So there you go. So with me today, we have our wonderful host. And I'm going to start with on my top left with Karen right now beer. Hello, Karen. And that's really interesting because I'm on the bottom right on my screen, but... <laughs> Who knows what I'll be on the recording. But hi, everyone. I'm Karen Balbier, Instructional Technology Specialist here in El Paso ISD, and I serve nine campuses. Thank you so much, Karen. Ms. Laura? Laura Salazar? All right, we'll skip you for a little bit. Earl? Hello, I'm Earl Yeager. Uh, I'm just I um, I don't even know what to say as far as joining you all today, but I'm I'm here to help out. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the way uh, AI is going to be affecting education, so I'll be I'll be talking with you all a little bit about that here in just a little bit. Awesome, Earl. Thank you for being on the show, and Miss Julie Rebus. Hello, everybody. My name is Julie Rebus, and I'm an ITS with seven campuses in the Northeast. And happy New Year to you all. Thank you for being here, all of you. Uh, it's, it's so exciting to be with you once again in this uh, new year. And we have a lot of good information to share. So I want to get started with our 12 Days of Tech Mess. Karen, can you give us an update on how that went? Hi, everyone. Sure, I'll go ahead and give you guys an update. And I think I want to um, even share my screen so I can kind of give you a little bit of a, a visual here since we have that opportunity. Well, first off, for uh, 12 Days of Tech Mess, um, this happened uh, December 1st, and every week we released a new challenge for our students. Um, it was brought to you by our instructional technology specialists, and here we go. And um, so we had we held it inside of our Schoology course. I just want to spotlight really quick some of the cool things that we received from our students um, that, again, were popping in um, every single day to receive a new challenge for our 12 days of tech miss. One of the um, the popular challenges happened on day two with the ugly sweater contest and our students utilized the application pages and created some very, very appealing sweaters that I think we could actually market. They're pretty good. Um, and we had a holiday anim an animated holiday card and we had lots of students across our district um, code inside of Scratch Scratch. And they submitted their animations to us. Um, and it was just neat to see all of the different locations where they created their animated holiday cards. And then the creation continued. <laughs> Students utilized um, a creation application on their Macs or iPads called Numbers. And they created some pixel art. And so we received a whole lot of submissions and creative ideas for things that um, students were um, making on their own, which I thought was awesome. This year, we also held our very first Minecraft EDU challenge, where students created their own winter wonderland. So there's just a, a quick little snapshot. Um, I was very impressed by all of the, the different wonderlands that were created by students. And we even had some videos where students were uh, taking us through um, just like a tour of the wonderland they, they created. So it was pretty awesome. Of course, we are all looking forward to, we had so much fun. We're looking forward to, um, launching this again next year in December. That was pretty awesome. I had so much fun looking at all those activities and uh, just interacting with the students, commenting. I thought that that's always my favorite piece is to be able to just tell them how great they did and, and then wish them a, a happy holiday season. So I hope they all had a wonderful time doing this and I hope they enjoyed the, the time they had off. You know, so when we I had over 1,070 70 students, right? That, that's exactly what I was going to say. Let me shout out how many uh, students we had jump in and participate, but you beat me to it. Sorry about that. But yes, over 1,070 students. That's a lot of uh, kiddos participating. And and, uh, and Julie, we had a, a special uh, email from, from one of uh, your teachers about that. Yeah, so 
I have a couple of teachers out at Dr. Torres Elementary that consistently have participated in our Technus activities. And so um, she did send an email thanking us for, you know, putting this together and having her students get the opportunity to complete these activities. So I know that she's one of she and her partner teacher are ones that actively support this every year. That was awesome. I, I, I loved uh, listening to the GarageBand recordings of their stories. Uh, th that was really fun, and uh, and I'm glad they got to use the tool. So it's not just about, you know, holidays, but it was it was a lot about creativity and using the the Apple tools that we have so readily available to all, to all our students and our teachers. So speaking of creativity, let's talk about our Apple Academy. <laughs> so. Um, we are wrapping up our final month of the Apple Academy. We did have participants that started back in August working on the Apple Academy. And so most of them have completed all of their projects um, that they were required to work on. And then we're working on their co-planning and co-teaching piece with their ITS. And so that is what we were working on right before the holidays, busy planning with them and completing those co-teaching opportunities. And so... We just wanted to highlight some of those teachers here at the end with a shout out, but just to let you know, it's been a lot of fun going into those classrooms. It, it always is um, going into those classrooms, working with the students and seeing the kind of uh, products that they create using the Apple creativity apps. So that's that's a little wrap up of what we've been working on with the Apple Academy. You know, I, I, and that is so fun to, to do. And, and this year being able to pull them out and actually working with them in a you know in a workshop setting where they had time to learn a little bit and then and do their work, do their projects, but also have our, our ourselves there to assist them as they're working along. I think that made a big difference for all of our participants. And I know that uh, I heard from participants uh, in you know in the previous academy saying, God, I wish I would have had that pullout time. Well, you know, we're, we're glad we're able to do it now. We hopefully we'll keep uh, we'll be able to continue doing it so that uh, we can have, be successful and have the teachers learn, but more than anything, take it back to their classroom and implement it with their students, which is really what we want for them to do. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the Blend of Learning Academy. So we have two academies that we run each year. We run our Apple Academy, and then uh, in the spring, which is coming up here soon, is our Blend of Learning Academy. Uh, this would be, oh, correct me if I'm wrong, our fourth Blended Learning Academy, something like that. It used to be our Blended Active and Active Learning. It's still Active Learning because I think we're all, you know, even with the Apple Academy, it should be the EPI's the Apple Active uh, Academy because it is active. We do a lot of stuff hands-on and we, we work on projects and we do all that stuff. But we're starting next week with a cohort of about 100, a uh, little bit over 100 uh, teachers. And uh, we're excited because that's also going to be a pullout type of academy. We're going to be having our teachers there learning with us, uh, you know, uh, learning about what blended learning is, how to use Schoology, how to integrate it, integrate it successfully so the students can use it as a, uh, you know, uh, a tool that they can access at any time and, and learn and, and rewatch and all that stuff. So we're really excited about our blended learning academy coming up next week. Uh, we can't wait to see our teachers and, uh, and and though, you know, 100's a small number. I know we had some teachers that, that were uh, ready to join, but we, we are kind of limited on that. We can't, we can't wait to do this again every year. And, uh, and hopefully we can find um, some more uh, space for them so that we can add some more people to this. So I'm excited about our learning, let blended learning academy that's going to start next week. We're going to go ahead and um, I'm going to start a, a conversation here with my buddy Earl, who is our, um, is, I, I call him our tech guru, right? And uh, and he, he just knows a lot about technology and we're so blessed to have him here uh, with us today because there's a new program out there, Earl, and it's called ChatGTP. Is that correct? Did I say that right? GPT. I keep messing that up. GPT, ChatGPT. Can you tell us in a nutshell? What artificial intelligence is? Sure. So um, artificial intelligence is a tool that helps to uh, automate certain kinds of things. It also uh, is a natural.
language processing tool. So you can ask it questions in just regular English. You don't need to have special programming knowledge or anything like that. And it will give you results back. And there's a, a lot of different ways that something like this could be used. And uh, artificial intelligence is a growing field. It's something that we're seeing a lot of and in a lot of different areas. So uh, would, would you say this is something rather new or has this been going around for a while now? So artificial intelligence has been around for quite a while. Um, in fact, I can remember uh, people studying it when I was in college back many moons ago in the, the 90s. So, uh, and in fact, at that time, they were talking about people who had been studying it back in the 70s. So artificial intelligence isn't a new idea, uh, but the levels to which we have brought it are, are definitely new. And so uh, ChatGPT is just the latest in a uh, series of a variety of different tools that are out there. Uh, there's examples in the uh, art field as well, uh, imaging. Uh, there's several different things like Dolly or Dolly 2. Uh, there is uh, a, a variety of other tools out there that allow you to put in a prompt uh, and it will produce artwork for you that fits that prompt. Uh, so ChatGPT is similar to those, but in this case, it actually produces a text result. And so we can ask it questions and it will provide us responses uh, to a variety of different questions in a huge variety of fields. One of the, the things that kind of differentiates ChatGPT from some of the things that have come before is its breadth of knowledge. It has a very wide, very broad range of uh, topics and fields that it's co uh, conversant on and can help with. So we've actually grown in the field of artificial intelligence. And, uh, and, and right now, this is probably the most popular tool out there, or at least the most talked about tool out there. And, uh, and it's really being talked about in the education channels, right? The, the conversation has really been uh, pretty big on this. And, and there's some pros and there's some cons that I've been hearing back and forth through various, uh, you know, leadership out there and, and education experts and ed tech technology experts. But what would you say? Uh, that this program, how do you feel it would benefit education? Well, as far as from the beneficial side of things, I think this has a lot of potential to first and foremost be an aid to the teacher. I think the teacher can utilize this tool to benefit themselves in the classroom. Uh, I think they can use it to uh, speed up their workflow. Uh, it can help them produce lesson plans. It can help them produce rubrics. It can help them produce tests and quizzes, uh, help them design assignments. So it can just be an aid to the teacher to help them do some of the, the, the uh, less interesting work, per se, that we're, we are required to do. And they can spend more time just refining the product that ChatGPT uh, uh, spits out for them and make it exactly what they need that way. Uh, but it can help you know, produce fast copies of a variety of different things. It can also be used to produce... Uh, student examples. It can be used to, uh, the, the uses are, are numerous and uh, amazing. Uh, from a student point of view, I think students can use it to aid them in producing work. Now, is there the potential to put, uh, have this do work for the student? Potentially, depending on how the teacher is asking them, the students to do the assignment and how what the uh, uh, assignment expectations are. Uh, if it's just a simple writing assignment where the teacher only asks the students to write a paragraph, potentially this tool could end up doing that for the student. However, if it's a more analytical uh, assignment, if it's something they have to present, if it's something that the student has to do some uh, critique upon, this can't do that quite as easily. So uh, depending upon the way you design assignments, depending upon the way you do things, I think this could potentially be a great aid to students uh, again, trying to produce that original rough draft sometimes is very difficult for some of our students. And if they take this as a tool to help them, and then they refine and work more dil diligently about getting a finer, more finished, polished copy of things, uh, I think this could be an aid for them to to do a lot of different things in their in their work. I've compared it before to the calculator. In many ways, uh, this is going to do for most content areas what the calculator did for math. A lot of teachers immediately assumed that the calculator was going to invalidate uh, math learning and that, you know, to have it in the classroom would be, uh, you know, giving the students all the answers and that they shouldn't have calculators for their use at all if they were going to be learning math. But 
in reality, it just becomes an aid. It just becomes something that we use to help verify answers, to help check to see if we know how to do our work, uh, and a variety of other ways we, we use those tools in the classroom today. Uh, it helps us do larger calculations that maybe we'd be able to do on our own, but we still have to know how to set up and uh, develop the, the know-how to do the calculations on the calculator. Similarly, I think we'll see the same with ChatGPT and tools like it. Uh, yes, it can do some simple writing for us, but we're still going to have to have some know-how on how to put things together, how to ask the appropriate questions of the tool to get the kinds of things we want, uh, and refine it to the point that it's actually a decent product. Terry, did you want to add something to that? Yes. I just wanted to ask Earl, I mean, Earl, um, do you have the capability of kind of giving us a quick show of some of the things yes. that you've tried? Yeah, I want to definitely want to share here. So let me, let's take a look at some of the things you can do with ChatGPT. So here I'm looking at the ChatGPT screen. Uh, over here on the left-hand side, these are the previous searches that I have done. So you can look back and see something that you have asked it about before and actually can continue that same conversation. So as an example, I had done a rubric here. Uh, I can go back over here and click on the rubric and it should bring that up for me. There we go. All right, so my initial query for ChatGPT was create a rubric for a slide presentation on the Spanish-American War. And so this is a great example of how you can put a prompt in and then further refine that prompt as you go through. So this was the first pass, it gave me the key different elements that it thought would be needed for a rubric. So it has an introduction, the historical context, key events, significance, visuals, delivery, and a conclusion. So then I said, well, revise the rubric to be on a 100-point scale. So then it said, sure, okay, here's a revised 100-point scale. So it has those same points, and it intelligently realized that things like key events, significance, and historical context were more important than visuals or delivery. And so it gave more points to those without me even asking. And so it already knew to do those kinds of things. So it has some understanding of what a rubric even is. Karen, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, so no, how long did it take for it to populate this rubric or uh, this refinement for you? Uh, less than a minute. So each of these requests took less than a minute for it to turn around and give me back. Uh, I asked it to give it to me in a table format. It instead spit it out as a table. Uh, I said, well, I want descriptions and levels in the table. Well, here it is. It gives me each of those categories now with levels and description in the table. So, and each of those things took less than a minute to generate. Now I want to translate into Spanish. I don't know if it can do that. <laughs> sure, let's try that out. This is pretty amazing. Earl, um, after we we tried this translation, um, where does where does Chat GPT get its information from? So, so Chat GPT, while it's while it's giving us our our response back here, I can go ahead and cl uh, clarify some of that. So it gets its information from a variety of different sources that it has. It is uh, what's called scraping. Uh, they took information off of internet websites, so they just kind of pulled all the information off of the internet on a huge variety of sources, uh, books, uh, web pages, news sites, you name it. Uh, but they stopped doing that in the year 2021. And so this doesn't know anything beyond that point. And it's not currently live connected to the internet. So uh, if you ask it about something that's uh, current news or something, it's not gonna have any idea about any of those kinds of things. So it's not gonna be able to answer some of those kinds of uh, questions. Uh, but up to that point, it's got a fairly broad range of knowledge across a variety of disciplines. And so you can ask it just about anything you'd like from uh, the past up through the year 20, uh, 2021 and get at least some form of a response on a lot of those kinds of things. It will, however, tell you if it doesn't know something, it will let you know it has no clue. Uh, but at the same time, if it thinks it knows but is wrong, it will be confidently wrong. So it's not easy to tell when it's giving you an incorrect answer unless you know something about the topic yourself. So if it answers, but it gives you an incomplete or partially wrong answer, you have to know enough about the topic to realize that because it won't 
clarify that for you. So it can be very confidently wrong about something. Now, going back to our uh, rubric here, as you can see, it happily translated it into Spanish for us, uh, including all of the categories, descriptions, uh, the levels, all of those things. Esto es increíble, say, Laura. I was just going to say, um, I haven't read it fully, but it looks pretty good to me. You know, Google Translate does not always make me super happy as a teacher, but I'm thinking about all of the hours and hours that I spent as a dual language teacher translating things. And this, this looks pretty good to me. Um, you know, not only did it create the rubric and refine the rubric, but it translated it for me. So I'm, I'm just thinking as a teacher, you know, and what Earl was saying that, you know, you do need to to, re to revise and to refine and to know what it is that you're looking for and make sure that you that you check it over. But but it looks like a time saver to me. Um, in my in my position as a as a dual language teacher, I I certainly would have used something like this. So another example I have here is uh, evaluating a student essay. So I put in here's a student essay and I copy and pasted an example student essay I had found online. And then at the end of this, I said evaluate it for correctness and grammar. It says, overall, the essay appears to be well-written and accurately describes the various processes of involving energy transfer in the cells. Here, there are a few grammatical areas for improvement, which I have noted below. So it finds the sentences, and then it tells us what is wrong with those sentences. So it says, for instance, this sentence here, it says this, is, this sentence is a bit wordy and could be simplified. Uh, here, the word out should be outside. So it finds these things and corrects them. And then at the end, it says, aside from these minor issues, the essay is well-written and presents the information clearly. Now, as a teacher, of course, I'm still gonna need to go through the essay myself and verify that the students really did what I asked them to do as a part of the essay. But for an initial pass, for an initial grab of all of the grammar issues and things like that that I might wanna point out to the students, this would speed up my reading of, of student work quite a bit. And I can look for more specific materials instead of having to focus on, say, like the grammar or spelling or other issues uh, as I go through my uh, evaluation, evaluation of different types of student work. I really like how it's giving feedback, which I think is pretty interesting. And also, I think about when I was teaching fourth grade and uh, revising and editing was a big part. And we would have students kind of peer edit each other's work. Um, and I, I, I mean, even just taking a look at this, I think it would be uh, a neat tool to even use with students to teach them um, to elaborate more on, like, if I'm going to, if I'm going to circle a word, well, here, like you said, the word out should be outside. Um, but there's a little bit, I mean, I guess that one's not an in-depth explanation, but, you know, this, this, even this little part that says it's a bit confusing and could be paraphrased <laughs> for clarity. Um, but I, I'm just surprised that that was able to like, it's able to populate this so quickly before I can even think about the question and where to start. It's like, it has an answer. Right. So this could be another area where, like you say, for use with students, students could write their own work, but then ask uh, ChatGPT to do a first pass, uh, uh, editing pass on their work for them before they go into further refinement. Again, ChatGPT doesn't know the wording of the assignment exactly, uh, unless you put that in. So it's not gonna know how to compare it against the assignment's wording necessarily, but the student needs to be aware enough of their own content area and what's ex expected of them to know that. But this could help them with the grammar, just could help them with the spelling and all of those kinds of things to make their writing uh, quicker and easier for them as well. And now that these kinds of tools are out there, they're going to be starting to show up in all kinds of things. Students are going to have to also not just utilize this to help them, but they're going to need to know how to use these things effectively in the marketplace because eventually they're going to be going into jobs and things where this is going to become a norm, that this is going to become something that they're expected to use effectively to speed up their work and become more efficient with it. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to be one of those things of less with more. Uh, the students are going to have probably less people working with them and they're going to be expected to do more because of tools like this because it'll help them be more efficient in that way uh, but i think they're going to be it's going to be necessary for them to learn how to use these kinds of things and my final example i want to go over for a teacher is a lesson plan example so i had asked uh, chat gpt to write a lesson plan for third grade math lesson on ordering and comparing fractions 
And so it gave me a lesson with various different steps. I said, add some active learning and elements to this lesson. So it came back and gave me several different kinds of active learning elements that I could then add into the lesson. I chose one kind. I said, expand upon the problem-based learning projects with more detailed ideas. So it took the idea from number four and broke that down into specific project ideas. And then just to make sure that it understood, I asked it with the math teaks for 3.3G and 3.38, because I knew I was wanting to target those teaks, but I wanted to know if uh, ChatGPT was even aware of them. And sure enough, it spit back exactly what those teaks were. So then knowing that it now knows them, I said, okay, revise the project ideas with those teaks in mind. And so now it revised the, the different project ideas specifically with those teaks in mind. And I didn't have to put out the text of the teak. I could just use the, the, uh, the idea to say, use the teaks, and it knew to use those teaks. And so it spits out now information specifically about these projects and how they relate to those teaks. It got kind of cut off, so I asked it to repeat it. And so then it repeated it again more clearly uh, because it got cut off the first time I had asked. So you can see how you can then ask it to do these things to, again, speed up your lesson planning. So once you've got that initial lesson plan, you can come in here and say, well, uh, you know, maybe I don't like this shopping project, so we're not going to even do that. But I didn't have to dream up any of these things originally. And so I can kind of cherry pick the ideas I really like and take that, put it into a lesson document, and then that's going to be my lesson plan for that day, week whatever the time period is that you're going to be covering that particular set of teaks or set of uh, skills. So I think, again, this could be a real time saver for teachers uh, and help them to, you know, be more efficient in their own use of their own time. And they're not going to have to spend quite as much of their efforts to create these things to begin with. So we definitely need to invest more time into this, this wonderful tool. Um, hopefully in the future we can have a panel of educators and, and experts in the AI field that we can definitely have a, have this conversation because I know it's a big, it's a hot topic right now in education. And this is brand new. I think, Julie, you were yep. saying this came out in November 30th or something like that. It um, came out it, at the end of November. Yeah. yeah. Right. So it's, and it's, Earl, you were saying it's only that, a month in. Right. And Earl, you had some resource where it said that um, it had more usage, more views than any of the yes. other tools. Uh, Tool, one of the ways they measure the, the popularity of some of these tools is how long it takes to get to a million users. And comparatively, if you look at tools like Twitter or Facebook, they took like 10 months, eight months to get to a million users. ChatGPT got to, 10, to a million users in five days. So that kind of shows you the, the popularity, how fast information is spreading about the tool and uh, kind of the effect that it's having on the population at large. Uh, one last demonstration I would like to do is I'd like to do kind of a live question. So I'd like to, just so that people can see how long it takes to answer something. And so if someone wants to give me a question so that I've not pre-prepared anything ahead of time, uh, if someone wants to throw out a question to me, I'll type it in and we'll see exactly how fast it can respond to something that we wanted to, to do for us. I know Jesus um, asked it to write a poem that actually came out really good. So why don't we do write a poem about a dancer and a frog? While you're writing that there, Earl, have you guys ever played uh, Beat the Calculator? Does anyone want anyone want to try to beat chat GPT right now? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Okay, I lost already. <laughs> All right. And it so, rhymes. Here's our poem. A dancer and a frog, in harmony they sway. The music fills the air as they move in perfect play. The dancer, light and graceful, her moves fluid and free. The frog, a creature of the swamp, yet he dances with such glee. Together they twirl and spin, their joy is plain to see. A bond of friendship strong between the dancer and a frog you'll be amazed to see. So let's all raise a glass to this unlikely pair, for in their dance they found a bond that's truly rare. Now, 
we can go and say. <laughs> I said, make this a haiku. And it's going to think about it a little bit. And it will instead give me a haiku. Dancer and frog in step, graceful movements, joyous hop, together in dance. So it can do quite a bit. Uh, well, I'll definitely be using this for a uh, Valentine's Day uh, love poem for my <laughs> wife. And, it's my and as you can see, uh, the point I was making is how fast it does these things. And so, you know, this is where you can gain, gain a lot of your time back uh, and be a lot more efficient with the tool like this. Definitely. And we, we're going to have to, like I said, explore this a bit more, uh, talk, you know, talk to, to our educators, uh, have a forum with our, our, uh, our, hopefully our AI experts out there, if we can find any that can, you know, give us all those pros and, uh, and how to really implement this. And as we're talking about blended learning, you know, and we're talking about, you know, students complain about the amazing amount of homework that they get every day. Is that really necessary? And how we can turn this tool into an aid that can get them started on working on such things in the classroom, right? So I, I'm excited to see a little bit more of this. I, I, I definitely want to have that follow up with this conversation. Earl, I want to thank you for being here with us, for showing us this great tool. One thing that we have noticed in the past few days is that when this came out, um, it was open in a yeah. sense, and now it's asking us to log in. So um, obviously that'll be a challenge to students in general, right? Uh, but it shouldn't be a challenge to our teachers. So if they really want to use this, implement this, I could see them, I could see, see asking, you know, you had that math question, or that math lesson, how I could have it create some math problems, story problems for me mm -hmm. that I can copy paste and use with my students, you know, and, and have them have different types of uh, different math problems and stuff like that, story problems that they can work on. Absolutely. So, it could absolutely do those kinds of things for you. So there's a lot of potential to this, and we're definitely going to come back to this, um, but we, we, we need to move on. So thank you so much for doing this for us, Earl. And I want to go ahead and uh, we want to highlight some of our, our virtual field trips for the month of January. So I'm going to let Laura talk to us about that. All right. Well, thank you, Earl. Yes, it is January, which means we are ready to take a look at some new virtual learning opportunities. So I'm going to go ahead and today I'm going to show you about uh, where they look like on our website. So this is our EPIS DTIL website. Um, and you can find this area of our website, the virtual field trips area under events. So if you start off in the front part of our website and you click on events right here, you'll find a tab that's called virtual field trips. Um, and this is being updated every once in a while, monthly or so. And so if you scroll down, you're gonna find some really, really great learning opportunities for the month of January. So I'm gonna highlight just a couple that I think look like really great opportunities. Um, the first few that we have here is from Flip, formerly known as Flipgrid. Uh, one that I think looks like so much fun is called, does it snow in the ocean? I don't know, does it snow in the ocean? Um, and this is with um, experts from Moat Aquarium. So if you click on these options that we have here, all that you would need to do is go ahead and uh, get some information about the event, and then you can sign up, register for the event here below. So Flip has a lot of great options each month, and you can go ahead and take a look at all of those that are available. Of course, Discovery Education has always great um, opportunities that are available also. So there's a really fun one coming up actually on February 16th called Behind the Scenes of Country Music's Biggest Night. So that's the CMA um, Awards. It's a virtual field trip. It's suggested for grades 6 through 12, so something that's um, available for our, our middle school and high school learners. And then moving right along, Connect to Texas is one of my favorite um, sites to go to to take a look at virtual learning opportunities also. So um, these are some great opportunities through Connect to Texas. As you scroll down here, there's a one through the Texas Parks and Wildlife Develop, um, Department. Um, and there's a few more opportunities as I scroll down here. Um, there's another one through a museum called the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art that looks pretty great. And there are also some opportunities as we scroll down here that are actually coming up for um, uh, for um, 
for the month of February also as, as we go down. So you want to take a look at these and just be prepared as they come along because they tend up to tend to come up pretty quickly and you want to just take a look at them and have them marked on your calendar. So um, again, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department has some really, really great opportunities. So you can go ahead and click on these, um, take a look at them, register for them, be prepared for them. Tons of great opportunities coming up in both January and February. Muchas gracias, Laura. That was amazing. I love virtual field trips, and I hope our teachers uh, take advantage of those because there's a lot of learning to be done from those as well. Uh, Karen, you want to go ahead and uh, do some shout outs for us, please? Absolutely. All right, first off, we're, we're going to do some Apple Academy shout outs here. That's one of our favorite things to shout out. That's one of shout out. And um, we put together a little graphic, so hence I'm but, but we want to give a shout out to several teachers here in our district that have gone through the Apple Teacher Academy. My goodness, they have worked so hard uh, completing projects, designing lessons, learning about lesson design, working with their instructional technology uh, specialist, and also co-teaching and applying the things that they've learned in the classroom. So uh, without naming all the names, they're here. But we do have some teachers from Andrus, Austin, Canyon Hills, Chapin, Sila Vista, onto the next page. Coldwell Cooley, Coronado, Dr. Tina Hero, Tom Lee, Huey, Nasita, Navarrete, Richardson, and Zavala. And guess what? There are more to come. Like, we're not finished with the co-teaching, but that is the final criteria in order to get onto this congrats shout out list. And so we're so part of, proud of our teachers and all of their hard work. Um, and of course, we have uh, more teachers to come and, and just want to thank our teachers for their incredible work. Um, this semester. And of course, we're getting excited about finishing up and just getting into the classroom with our additional Apple teachers that are working through their Apple teacher certification here in EPISD um, with our Vanguard. And just shout out to them and their classes. Thank you so much for sharing, Karen. And I know Julie uh, has some important information to share about the Film Fest and robotics. Can you share that for us, Julie? And you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we do have our film fest coming up in April, April 22nd, but we have our intent to participate deadline next Friday, January 13th, Friday the 13th. So if you do have students in your classes that are um, going to go ahead and create films for the film fest, you do have to submit the intent to participate um, by next week. Um, we also have our middle school robotics competition coming up on February 25th. Those campuses that do already have teams working, the challenge is already up and posted in our robotics team channel. So make sure that you have already accessed that and give it to your students the next time you do meet. And for our elementary, elementary robotics, um, that challenge, I want to get out today. So hopefully it will be out and posted today so that you can meet with your teams next week and start working on that. And our competition for elementary is coming up on March 25th. And we do have a little giveaway. So those of you in elementary robotics, if you've been doing your check-ins, I will be posting something about a giveaway today as well. That's awesome, Julie. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I want to I want to give a, a big thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, you guys uh, spend a lot of time out there at the campuses, and and I know this this takes a bit of that time away. So I want to we appreciate everything you guys do and the sharing of the information that uh, our teachers are so happy to receive. So this podcast should be coming out by next week for them. So uh, make sure that uh, you know you you guys out there in the, our audience listens to this great conversation. Earl, thank you so much for joining us and and talking to us about Chat GTP and and I'm I'm gonna get the name right sooner or later and making sure and showing us examples because that that's just an amazing tool because I've been playing with it. I've only done a few things, but that was just amazing. And then the Spanish thing was wow just blew me out of the water because like laura said as a dual language teacher that would have made my life a whole lot easier there's a lot of tools out there right now that uh that are that incorporate this uh some type of ai that's checking for our work and writing so it, it's great it's amazing and, and i can't wait to put it to good use so once again i'd like to um thank our audience if you want to leave some feedback let me just share my screen here really quick we do have a place on our website where you can uh, you can view that and it's uh, it's an, it's on our website at tinyurl.com episdtil home 
So you can definitely uh, view that uh, on our website. And uh, in the It's Time Talk Time blog page, not only can you see our recordings past, you know, previous recordings for all of our sessions, but you can also leave us a message. So when you click on here, it's going to take you to an audio recording uh, page. It's pot in a box that we use for our messages. And we do actually have some messages here from some of our uh, teachers. If you have any questions, any comments, uh, please go ahead and drop them in here. Give us some shout outs, give us some comments, and we will uh, gladly share that on air during our uh, podcast sessions. Okay. Also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at EPISD underscore ITS on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at EPISD Tech and Learn. All right. Before we leave, it is the new year, and I want to share a New Year's quote from what we call the father of American literature, Mr. Ralph Waldo Emerson. And Ralph Waldo Emerson says, write it on your heart that every day is the best day in the year. So let's make this year the best every single day that we have at home with our families, at school with our students and our colleagues. Every day, let's make it positive. Let's stay happy. Let's make people around us as happy as they can be as well. So this has been another great episode of the It's Talk Time podcast. This is a production of the Technology Integration and Learning Team, which is a part of the Digital Learning and Resources Department here at EPISD. We wish you all a very happy and exciting new year, and we hope that the rest of your Friday is just as enjoyable and that your weekend is even that much better. So I want to thank you on behalf of the entire team, and I want to say adios. Adios, everybody. Thank you.